Well, I welcome everybody. Hi, I'm Lisa Bingley, the um, Operations Director at the Myra Technology Institute, and I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker. We've got Dr. David Croft online, and he is the Assistant Professor in Computer Science for the Institute of Coding at Coventry University. His expertise lies within the fields of data science and robotics, and he's currently the course leader for the Connected Autonomous Vehicle Systems uh, Master's Degree, and uh, that's taking part at, that's happening at the Myra Technology Institute and it's in collaboration with um, Hariba Myra. He's also the staff supervisor for Coventry University Formula Student AI team which we often have on show at the MTI. So um, I'll just give you a little intro to the lecture that David's going to give to us today. It's called Keep Your AIs on the Road so if, if that's the one you're looking for you're in the right place. <laughs> it is a high level look at the different sensors used on autonomous vehicles with simulated demonstrations and a discussion of the challenges and opportunities for the future. Uh, just like to prompt you, if you're listening in, that um, if you get your questions in early, um, that will stop the silent gap in between the end of the presentation and the question and answering session. So yeah, get those questions in and we can sort through and get them ready for David when he finishes. So I'll hand over to David. Perhaps while we're waiting for it to come online, there has been a question already. Oh, let's have a look. Uh, so the first question was from Timothy Marshall, and it says, "David, have you used the words? You have used the words autonomy and automatic interchangeably, but they're very different. AI is another yeah. different definition. Is this important?" Yes, I, I have done that, haven't I? Um, and I am aware that I do tend to uh, treat it together. Um, no, no, you are correct that AI and autonomy, sorry, automatic and autonomous are, are, are not um, the, the same thing. Automatic means that it can operate with some human involvement and autonomy means that it can operate without human involvement. Um, one of the difficulties at the moment is that it does depend somewhat on what level of self-driving ability we're talking about as to whether we are discussing automatic systems or autonomous systems. Things like automatic emergency braking, for example, where the vehicle can automatically detect that there is a pedestrian or some other obstacle in the way and initiate braking would form a key part of an autonomous system um, but are, is not as an individual advanced driver automation system autonomous in and of itself. Um, <clears throat> there is, you are correct, um, a, a difference between the two terms, but it's it's a little bit blurred at the moment as to exactly when we move from having automatic assistance systems in vehicles into having autonomous vehicles. Um, but I, I do take your point. Uh, David, thank you. Um, there is one more question, but just to, it's to say that we can't quite see the screen share yet. So perhaps ah. try that again. <laughs> Apologies. Um, and um, Colin has put a message on here saying it sounds wonderful, but do the public want it? Um, would they trust it? I wouldn't. I think we all have our own opinions. Okay, well, I've tried sharing it again. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, yes, so th there is definitely a public acceptance issue regarding these systems, and a degree of nervousness is understandable and, frankly, entirely justified. At the moment, the most prominent example of self-driving vehicles is the Tesla autopilot system which is level two and as we have seen a proportion of the population is willing to accept level two autonomy and is willing to put perhaps too much faith in level two autonomy given its actual capabilities. That being said Tesla is powering on um, in this area and making great strides. Um, Elon Musk was promising full autonomy um, only last week, although I suspect that 
by the SAE definitions, what he means is conditional autonomy. So certainly some people are willing to accept it. What I don't think is that there is any possibility in the next few years of self-driving vehicles being mandatory, as in you know, the, the, the societal shift in the acceptance of these technologies such that no one would dare drive a car manually. What, what kind of you know, monster are you? So uh, manually driven vehicles will be with us for a while. So these systems will not be required. But what we will definitely start to see are more and more safety systems being integrated into vehicles. We're already seeing things like automatic emergency braking. We've had anti-lock brake systems in our vehicles for what, decades and a half now, at least. No one objects to ABS brakes. In five years time, will anyone object to automatic braking systems? Will any, anyone object to automatic lane departure warning systems? Probably not. And so there's you know, shades of gray as you step closer and closer and closer to an autonomous vehicle, which will allow people to come to accept them without suddenly going from, right, you're in charge of everything, to now the car does everything in one leap. A few more questions come in. Um, oh, hang on, I've got to refresh. Um, oh, here we are in the inbox. If you try the priority, I'm moving them across for you. Okay. What's the biggest barrier to deployment of autonomous vehicles? Is it the actual technology, i.e. the AI, or is it the certification of the systems? Ah, excellent um, question, and something that we are very aware of as part of the design of the Connect Autonomous Vehicle Systems with Hariba Myra. So obviously Myra does an awful lot of vehicle testing at their site and has a keen focus on the verification and validation of vehicle systems. And this is one of the key reasons that we wanted to partner with them in the development of this course so that students would be instilled with, how to say this, instilled with the correct attitude towards the safety um, of the systems that they were developing. Because it's all very well me as an academic device using some beautiful new AI algorithm and you're running it for a few tests and simulation, but that's not good enough to put these systems out on the real road in the general public's hands. That is just not um, an acceptable system. And no vehicle manufacturer w would just do stick an experimental system um, on, on the road um, with no supervision. Um, so verification and validation is a problem which will need to be solved. Um, and again, like the legal issues regarding insurance will need to be solved, but those are a societal and legal issue as opposed to a technological one. The biggest issue with validation of the systems at the moment is probably that a lot of these AI systems are black boxes. So things like neural networks, we train them up, but we and we can see that they appear to work, but we don't really understand how they work internally. Uh, we can understand you at a high level, but understanding how this specific one is working is not easy or necessarily achievable. So the question is, can we validate and approve systems for general use based on their apparent performance, based on their performance having driven 10,000 miles or something? Um, as opposed to having a full understanding of how the system operates. And I don't see a reason why not, because frankly, that's how we approve human drivers. We stick the person in the car and we let them drive around a bit and we see if they mess up and if they don't mess up, we let them drive. So the reason why we couldn't potentially let an AI system drive 10,000 miles 
and then say, yep, okay, fine, you're not crashing, um, we can approve you. An approach like that was, would have difficulties, but it would still probably decrease the number of accidents that we see on the road. So what is the single biggest challenge theoretically remaining to be solved to clear the way for a level five vehicle? Um, I'm honestly not convinced we can achieve a level five vehicle with our current AI technology. Um, again, it depends somewhat on how you define level five, but if we think about level five as a high level, you know, with one definition, can drive itself under any circumstance. You know, full human um, capable system, or better than human capable system. And that means covering a huge range of different circumstances. I mean, I drive a car, um, but I would not trust myself to drive a car in, let's say, India, or, or you know, a, a country where the driving style and the driving customs is noticeably different to that in the UK. Um, we just not to you know, criticise you know, any particular country with their driving styles, but it is undeniably a very different driving system. Um, I have got friends Go that ahead. won't drive Go into... Oh. Screen shares on. Yay. <laughs> okay, I will come back to that question uh, later on, and let's see um, how we do. Okay. Um, I think we've probably just blown our time allocation, so I'm going we'll to go through. through this. Yes, I'm going to go through this as per normal, and I fear that we will just go past the scheduled end of the session. Um, but I might drop a couple of side bits. Anyway, um, so the big development here was microelectromechanical systems, which use the same technology to produce them as were used in um, producing central processor units, so stereo, so lithography, for example, in order to build up layers of atoms. So these are you know, physical mechanical devices, but on a scale, ridiculously small scale. The image in the bottom right-hand corner is a MEM device, and if that image was to actual size, the image would be one-tenth of a millimeter across. So making them at this size means that they are incredibly cheap, incredibly small, the price is nothing. Um, they have high power efficiency and they have high reliability. If you compare it to the equivalent of an IMU from, say, World War II, um, in the top right-hand corner we have the IMU, that's in air quotes, by the way, from a V1 rocket. Uh, <clears throat> so there have been dramatic improvements in the technology over uh, the years, but they are still doing pretty much the same thing. Why do we have iron news in vehicles at the moment? Well, we have them for things like crash detection, airbag deployment, things like vehicle stability control, um, anti-operating systems potentially. You have almost certainly seen an IMU in operation. If you're using a GPS system and you drive into a tunnel, the little the car keeps moving on the car navigation system, even though it clearly cannot have a GPS any information coming from the GPS to indicate that it's moving, it will most likely be using the IMU in the vehicle or in your phone to estimate your position based on its current speed and current rotation. In a self-driving vehicle, IMUs would be a brilliant fail-safe system. You may have seen things like the Google Waymo car, and they have these beautiful LiDAR sensors right on the top of the vehicle, and that's great right up until the moment you go through like a low car park or something that knocks it off. So IMUs being as robust and cheap and efficient as they are, you could use them as, if all the other sensors go down, drop over to IMU, um, and it will bring the vehicle to a controlled stop over a few seconds. Uh, also, IMU is absolutely key 
they are the foundation on which a lot of the more advanced sensor systems will be used. So for example, when we start talking about LiDAR, these LiDAR mapping systems of the environment are completely dependent on um, the IMU data in order to simplify the calculations that they need to do to model the world. So on to our first simulation. So the simulation software that we are using for this is called Webox. Uh, the car control is being done in something called the robot operating system. Uh, this is a series of tools which is widely used in academia for doing robotics research. It's used in some production level vehicles. Probably not going to be seeing it in a self-driving vehicle, a production self-driving vehicle anytime soon, I should say, as it does have a single point of failure. But there are new versions coming out which might achieve that. The robot operating system control that we're using doesn't know it's in a simulation. As far as it's concerned, this is a real vehicle. Uh, it makes no difference to it. The visualization tool that we're using is called Arvid, which is part of ROS. And if you want to explore Webox in your own time, there, there's a thousand of one tutorials online. But there's a very easy system if you go to robotbenchmark.net, which allows you to interact with Webox through your web browser. But anyhow, first um, demonstration. Now, I'm afraid that this is not the most exciting simulation. Um, but it is the basis on which the following simulations will be built. So what we have here on the left hand side is our vehicle. Um, I've got a nice BMW X5, which is just driving around the world. And on the right hand side, we have the world as the IMU is seeing it. So what's happening here is that the IMU is sampling the readings from the gyroscope and the accelerometers. Uh, what, how fast did I set this? I set this to run at 500 hertz, I believe. Um, so 500 times a second. And by combining these data together 500 times a second, it can produce a reasonable estimate of how the vehicle is moving and where the vehicle currently is. If we leave the simulation running, the estimated position via the IMU and the real position in the simulation or in the real world will diverge further and further. But we can produce pretty good um, estimations over short ranges. So I'm going to stop there now. Like I said, it's not the most exciting um, simulation, but we will build off this. Okay, so now on to the cool centers. Uh, so we're going to talk about the different sensors which would substitute for vision if we were a human. So these might be things like LIDAR, which stands for light radar. These might be good old radar, you know, the classic, and of course cameras. Um, we as humans obviously manage this with just a couple of cameras, um, or potentially less if you're a pirate. They allow us to perceive objects far away. And this is important because if we can't perceive objects at a distance, we're going to drive straight into those objects, which is obviously not good. Different sensor systems here have different advantages. So for example, uh, LiDAR and radar will work at night um, very successfully. Camera systems, camera systems have difficulty at night. You need to have some kind of illumination via headlights, and that obviously limits the range. Uh, Systems like radar are extremely good in poor weather conditions, so rain or snow. LiDAR and camera systems are affected to greater or lesser degrees by rain or snow getting in the field of view. There is a huge amount of investment at the moment in LiDAR. Uh, to be perfectly honest, there is almost certainly too much investment in LiDAR at the moment, and some of the LiDAR companies which are currently in existence will almost certainly be closing over the next few years. There's just too many at the moment uh, and the market doesn't need the, the number that there are at present. So there will be a degree of consolidation over the next few years. The classic design for a LiDAR system was that you had a laser and then you had a spinning mirror 
and you fire the laser at the spinning mirror and it goes round and round and round and it directs the laser beam in a 360 degree arc around the sensor system or 180 degree arc or whatever it depends on the lidar sensor that you purchased and you send out this laser beam and you wait for the laser beam to hit the object and the flat bat and by recording the time that it takes for the laser beam to go to the object and come back and by knowing the speed of light and air you can work out how far away the object is accuracy of this is very high we're talking millimeter um, accuracy levels which is extremely promising but the downside of this approach was that you only got a single 2d slice through the world um, so certain companies at, like Belladyne resolved this issue by putting multiple lasers into a single LiDAR unit. So they had things like their um, HDL64E model, which was the you know, top range LiDAR for a long time, which had 64 individual lasers in a unit. And it would fire up 64 laser beams, spin them around and record the environment in that way. And these are the sensor systems that you may have seen on top of the Google Waymo cards. Those are Velodyne 64 LiDAR systems. More recently, <clears throat> there have been things like solid state designs. These do not um, require moving parts, but they have a far more limited field of view. So they can't give you 360 degree coverage. So you have to have multiple units. Uh, and of course, that drives up the cost. The image on the right that we have here is the sensor data from a LiDAR unit from a company called Luminaire. Now, what this company does is that they have two laser systems, so two lasers in their system, and a series of steerable mirrors. And the mirrors direct the laser beam left and right and up and down over the field of view in order to provide the level of the field of view that is required. You can see in the center of this image, there are these little ovals. And that's where the data from one laser is being overlapped with the data from the other laser. So they have two laser system, two lasers in their system, and that gives them 120 degree um, field of view. Now there is a certain downside of this. <clears throat> Uh, we're talking about lasers here, and if we want to see far, we need to have high-powered lasers, which is all well and good. Um, on the other hand, high-powered lasers, generally not great for people looking at them. I'm sure that you've seen the warning labels on laser pointers and things saying, don't look straight at me. And that's you know, fine. What you don't want to have is hundreds of cars driving past you all firing lasers into your eyeballs. There was a highly publicized incident at CES 2019 where a photographer was taking the picture that you see in the top right hand corner of the screen, taking a picture of an um, autonomous vehicle prototype with LiDAR fitted to the top of it, and the laser beam damaged the camera. It burnt out the camera sensor, and all subsequent photos that the photographer attempted to take had these purple splotches in there where the sensor had been damaged. You know, potentially just imagine that that was your eyeball and it had burnt out the back of your retina. Not good. So to solve this, there is fortunately a workaround. The human eyeball is opaque to light at 15-50 nanometers. So as long as you design your LiDAR units to operate at 15-50 nanometers, they should be safe for human eyes. On the other hand, they're still not safe for camera systems. And where are we going to have a lot of camera systems in proximity to a lot of laser beam LiDAR systems? Well, on all the other self-driving vehicles on the road. So some consideration needs to be given to these sort of things. Otherwise, you have one self-driving vehicle blinding the self-driving vehicle next to it, which is obviously not ideal. So filters and things will need to start being incorporated into vehicles if LiDAR units become more prominent. The other big con of LiDAR units is that their price has traditionally been 
extremely high. So I talked about the Velodyne 64 laser LiDAR system a moment ago. A few years back, that system would cost you about $75,000, um, which is, let's be honest, probably more than the car it was fitted to. Um, if you end up with multiple LiDAR systems on a vehicle, that just increases the cost. So, for example, we have in the top right hand corner a picture of Stanley, who was the winner of the DARPA Grand Challenge in 2005. And you can see that Stanley is equipped with five LiDAR systems on its roof rack. Uh, now, fortunately, these are somewhat cheaper than the $75,000 Velodyne units, but it still adds up. Now, Lumina, who was in the example I used previously of the two lasers, being steered by mirrors, they have apparently broken the $1,000 mark um, for their LiDAR system. And we can actually see that in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. This is an example of the Lumina LiDAR sensor being integrated into the Volvo SPA2 modular architecture, which is supposed to come out in 2022. So if you don't know, Volvo has this cool modular architecture where multiple vehicles are on the same basic frame, um, basic powertrain, electrical systems. And then you get multiple different models of a common architecture. Well, in their next architecture, they are incorporating self-driving features, including the Lumina sensor. And this is really important, I think, um, because you cannot be strapping thousand dollar sensors to the roof rack of a production car. It's just not going to be accepted by consumers. There are concerns regarding um, damage to the sensors. There's concerns regarding the security of the sensors. So seeing big manufacturers such as Volvo start to incorporate these systems into more and more mainstream vehicles is very um, encouraging for the future of the field. <clears throat> okay, so now we've got a couple of demos. So first off, I'm going to do a demonstration of a classic 2D LiDAR sensor so that you can see the issues that would exist in a vehicle like that. And then we will show you a simulation of the new Luminar style sensor systems. Okay, so the, notice that the vehicle is moving through the world on the right hand side of the screen. This is because we are layering the data from the 2D LiDAR on top of the data from the IMU sensors. So you can see as we drive down this road, there's some people in the road, but because our 2D LiDAR sensor in this simulation is placed on the roof of the vehicle, it can't see them at all. You notice there's a vehicle on the left hand side of the road here. Again, because our LiDAR sensor is on the roof of our vehicle, it's just looking straight over the top of it. It can't see the vehicle at all. So if we had been trying to use these 2D LiDAR sensors, uh, we would have had to angle them or place them lower down on the vehicle. But that then has issues regarding the long range visibility of the sensor. So there's things you can do to improve this, for example, um, multiple LiDAR sensors, um, angling them, remembering sensor data over, over a certain time period to build up a complete picture. But it does add significant challenges to building a vehicle. So it's really great that we have got nice new LiDAR sensors. such as the ones from Lunar, or such as the 64 systems from Velodyne. Which give us just so much more data. So as I said, this is a 
approximation of the sensor data you would get from one of the new luminar sensors. Um, and you can see that in systems such as this, we can make out far more detail. We can make out, for example, the pedestrians. We can make out the vehicle in the distance back here. We have a much greater understanding of our environment. So no one is denying, well, I think it's safe to say that no one is denying that LiDAR, uh, LiDAR sensors are absolutely fantastic for the data that they give us. It really has just been the excessive cost which has posed issues for their inclusion in self-driving vehicles. Okay. Next type of sensor system I want to talk to you about is LIDAR. Not LIDAR, radar. These work on the same principle as LIDAR. We're sending out a pulse of energy and we're recording how long it takes for that pulse to come back to us. So in LIDAR we were sending out light, um, in radar we are sending out radio waves. Same time of distance calculation gives us the distance to the object. There are clever things that can be done. So Bosch, for example, does this in some of their top end units. You can modulate the radar signal and then look at the effect, look at the changes that have had happened to that modulation when the radar signal comes back in order to detect things like vehicle direction and speed of movement of the object which is being perceived. There's actually a question on the um, chat here where I'm being asked, what role do you think ground penetrating radar might play, e.g. wave sets? And this is the subsurface mapping concept. This is, well, I will admit that when I first heard of this, it was a fair, I thought it was a fairly out there idea, but it does make a lot of sense if you think about it. What they are doing is using ground penetrating radar to produce an identifying fingerprint of the environment beneath the road. So the vehicle can detect where it is on the road to centimeter accuracy via matching the under road surface it is currently seeing with its ground penetrating radar to a pre-existing map of the subsurface that has already been produced by some previous vehicle. Um, and this makes a lot of sense. So instead of trying to position yourself on the road by looking above the ground, where there are lots of other cars and pedestrians moving and the environment is constantly changing. Instead, you try and localize yourself by looking below the ground, which doesn't change very much. So there's a lot of very cool things that can be done um, with radar, but their primary use is in the similar way to LIDAR, looking above the ground to see into the distance. So advantage of radar users is that they are, they will see through rain and snow much better than LIDAR will. LIDAR can be easily blocked by heavy snow or, or rain. However, the disadvantage of radar is that it is of a lower resolution because the wavelength of the Radio wave wavelengths are much higher, are much longer than the wavelength of light, and therefore the max, the best resolution which can be perceived by a radar unit is significantly lower than that of lidar. On the other hand, they are much cheaper than lidar, so there are swings and roundabouts. To give an indication of these sorts of differences in resolution, um, this was taken from the paper here by Bosch, where they were looking at uh, three vehicles over here on the left hand side of the screen. Depending on the resolution of the radar unit which is being used, if you have a 12 antenna radar unit, you can just about, you can see that there's something there, 
that there's definitely you know, some sort of object in front of the radar unit, but it's not particularly easy to discern that there are even separate objects. It's just, it could be one large object, it could be three smaller objects, it's not entirely clear. If you improve the resolution using, say, a 44 antenna radar unit, you can start to make out individual vehicles. But that's still not going to be helpful in work identifying, say, individual pedestrians. Really high resolution radar units um, can start to make out images such as we see in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Um, so you can start to identify individual objects, individual pedestrians, but it's not necessarily going to be possible to identify that that is a pedestrian. You will know that there is an object, but not necessarily what the object is. So let's do a quick demonstration. So this is an approximation of what a relatively high resolution radar system would say if mounted on a self-driving vehicle. As you can see, as we come up to the pedestrians, we can definitely identify that there are objects in the road. We can see that there is something there, but it's not necessarily going to be possible to identify what those objects are based on. Uh, the data that we are getting back from the radar units. Still, potentially, very useful um, radar units on a self-driving vehicle because they have a much greater, um, they can see much further than LIDAR units. So being able to detect, for example, that there is a whole bunch of stopped objects in the distance would allow the vehicle to start to break and to start to slow down well in advance and give the vehicle more time to determine exactly what is going on in the distance so that it doesn't just drive straight into it. So radar, given its low price, given its advantages, quite likely to appear on self-driving vehicles in conjunction with LiDAR or other sensor systems. And finally, we come to camera systems. Um, nothing particularly special about these, um, just a high resolution camera, although not a particularly high resolution. For example, the Tesla um, autopilot system uses a 720 resolution camera, which is not even full HD by the standards of TV shows. Some systems, for example, Efficient PS, which was um, recently announced and published by University of Freiburg in Germany, Germany um, works on 4K video. But the key aspect with camera systems is the post-processing steps, which are required in order to interpret the data which comes in. So an awful lot of work being done um, at present in producing image um, segmentation systems which can look at a camera feed and identify what the individual pixels in that image are. So we can see that with the efficient PS system here, for example, it's been really quite successful in identifying individual pedestrians, in identifying individual buses, individual cars. If you notice the kind of purpley mauve color on the bottom that's identifying where the road surface is and it's doing this whilst vehicles are driving over it um, it's really very impressive um, this approach is based on a convolutional neural network approach so this is exactly one of the systems we talked about earlier when i said that we cannot be fully certain how the system is working. Because neural networks are black box systems, we, the only way to validate a system such as this 
for use by real production vehicles would be to let it drive around and just see if it works. We're not going to be able to do a kind of formal mathematical proof of the system to validate it that way. Now, <clears throat> at Coventry University, uh, we use a stereoscopic camera system um, so from a company called Zcams, which is used to produce a virtual point cloud. So it's used to simulate LiDAR sensors. And the reasons for that is primarily due to cost. Um, because a stereo stereoscopic camera system is a couple of hundred pounds, whereas a LiDAR sensor system is potentially thousands of pounds. And this is an approach which is used by other companies. So Tesla, for example, does not have LiDAR sensors in its vehicle. Instead, the autopilot system works via a combination of radar and camera. So Tesla um, vehicles have multiple cameras in them looking around the vehicle. What they do is that they use machine learning approaches and AI classification techniques on the camera image to identify what an object is. And then they overlay that with the radar data to identify how far away that object is. And back in May, they announced that their approach combining radar and camera systems was now equivalent to LiDAR in the quality of the data that it produced. Um, I'm hoping that they'll publish some more information on that soon. Uh, but if true, that would be a significant step forwards because it means that you could get the kind of very high quality data that we get from LiDAR without the very high price tag which has always been the stumbling block for LiDAR in production vehicles. So there is a big debate at the moment as to whether it is possible to achieve LiDAR quality data without LiDAR. And it's a bit of a race to see if achieving LiDAR quality data without LiDAR happens first, or whether the cost of LiDAR simply drops to the point where you can put LiDAR in a vehicle anyway. And it's an unanswered question as to which way self-driving vehicles might go, or if there might be different approaches from different manufacturers. And finally, on to, um, well, we'll continue with cameras. Um, one of the most interesting thing about camera systems or self-driving vehicles are the ways that they fail. So we think about cameras on vehicles, well, obviously humans manage to drive um, cars with just a couple of cameras, so surely our vehicles should be able to do the same. And yes, potentially our vehicles could do it with just a couple of cameras. Um, but what we've seen coming out are various attacks on vision systems in autonomous vehicles. So it was a few weeks back um, from Ben Gurion University, Israel, um, they published this paper showing various ways that they did naughty things um, to vehicles. So, for example, they were able to project pictures of pedestrians onto the road surface, and the Tesla autopilot systems would detect that as an actual person who had to be stopped um, before you ran over. Or, in the bottom right-hand corner, they used a drone to project an image of a speed sign onto a wall for a fraction of a second, the vehicle picked it up as an actual speed sign and accelerated because it now thought that the speed limit was 90. So these are some very low tech attacks which could have some really nasty consequences on self-driving vehicles. And I know you might be saying, well, who would do that to a self-driving vehicle? What kind of person would do that? But in a lot of the world, things like carjackings are still a real risk. 
on an everyday basis. Even in you know, the UK, carjackings are not unheard of. So being able to trick your nice, expensive, new self-driving vehicle to come to a stop while someone, by, while someone carjacks you just by sticking a cardboard cutout on the road is potentially going to be a problem. Anyway, I think I'm hearing someone indicating that we need to bring this to a close because we have gone over our time. Um, I will apologise. I'll just quickly show this demo and then we can go on to questions. So we can see a demonstration of the sorts of attacks which could potentially be done to self-driving vehicles. So if you have a look on the right hand side of the screen, you would you will see the wrong image. There we are. You can see that we've got our car and it's got our camera system and it's identifying in the vehicle in the field of view, the cones which are in the vehicle's way. And you can see, uh, yep, it's detected the cone on the left, yep, it's detected the cone on the right. If we have a look at our simulation, we can see that the cone on the left is not actually a cone. It's just a painting that someone's put on the road surface. And yet, our classification system is very definitely identifying that as a real obstacle to be avoided. So these kind of low tech attacks against self-driving vehicles, certainly self-driving vehicles as they currently exist, are a definite concern um, and there's not really an answer as of yet as to how to resolve these types of issues. And then there was hearing, um, and different ways that vehicles could communicate with infrastructure or different vehicles or pedestrians and things, but we'll skip over that because I haven't got a simulation to show with that. Um, that's it then. Um, I would just quickly like to take this opportunity to promote the Connected Autonomous Vehicle Systems Master's course. This course is starting in September of this year. It's jointly developed by Coventry University and Hariba Myra. It will be taught by a combination of Coventry University and Hariba Myra staff from industry. And its focus is on developing the kind of safe, secure and verified self-driving and advanced driver automation systems, which we are likely to start seeing over the next few years and decades. There's a link on the screen, um, which I will make available in a bit. If you're interested in the course, please go to that link and get in touch. If you're interested in anything that the Institute of Coding uh, does, any of our other activities such as data science courses or Internet of Things courses, please contact Deepak or Louise. And that's the end. So um, I'll Thank go you, through. David. I'll let, uh, yes. So apologies for overrunning. Oh, brilliant. And apologies for technical issues partway through. Well, we did well um, coping with the technical. Left. Issues. Thank you, David. Um, yeah. So if we go into questions and we'll try and do a, six or seven minutes on questions. Um, David, if you look at your priority inbox, there's quite a few in there if you wanted to select some out of there. Um, OK, well, how to pick between left and right drive vehicles. Yes, regional variations between different vehicles is going to be a problem. Already we're seeing things that vehicles trained for the nice wide roads of America struggle somewhat on the narrow, narrower roads of the UK. So a degree of translation or you know, changing of settings is likely to be required, but it really does depend on the level of automation that we are discussing. Um, so for example, Volvo's SAE system which is potentially going to achieve level four autonomy, is going to be rolled out on a region by region basis. So you will only be able to use those features in certain geographic regions. So features such as left, right drive could be handled by, um, you know, limiting which areas you could use the vehicle. 
but the vehicle should be able to adapt to left or right drive. As it is, I can take my car, drive over to France, and I've got to drive on the other side of the road. So unless you want to change your vehicle at the border, um, self-driving vehicles are going to need to be able to adapt to different road sides. Uh, next one. In the media, there's been a lot of highlights with 5G and AI vehicles technology. Will it be viable to use AI vehicles without 5G? And is there a latency issue that can hold AI vehicles back? Again, it would depend on what exactly is being done over 5G. If you're just talking about trying to do traffic um, alerts or identify where the nearest free parking space is, latency is really not going to be an issue. If you're trying to offload processing off the vehicle, you know, do some kind of cloud computing system, um, then yes, latency could definitely be an issue. But I would not be comfortable in a self-driving vehicle that offloaded safety critical parts of its code to some cloud device elsewhere in the world. What problems do you foresee with a combination of manual autonomous vehicles both driving on the same road? Should the vehicles be kept apart? Yes, I definitely see problems regarding self-driving and manual vehicles on the road. On the other hand, I'm not sure that the problem is with the self-driving vehicle. I have seen some truly interesting manual drivers on the road. I'm sure we've all been carefully pootling along at the speed limit only to have some complete nutter shoot past us or drive right up our bumper honking their horn and flashing their lights. I suspect that the issue will not be in self-driving vehicles doing strange things as far as manual drivers are concerned. I suspect, but I can't prove, but the issue will be in manual drivers doing things which the self-driving vehicles don't understand. Where do we currently stand with liability between driver and vehicle manufacturer? Where does the responsibility lie? Um, this is a question which is going to need to be answered. Um, unfortunately, I suspect that the question will be answered after we've got self-driving vehicles on the road. Um, I, whilst it would probably be a lot better to work out these liability issues first, I suspect that the liability issues will be solved second. Because as we've seen, there's things like the um, Tesla autopilot systems, which is already on the road, already driving right now. Um, and yet guidance on that point of view from an insurance standpoint is not as clear as it perhaps should or needs to be. Uh, how far we went with LiDAR system? Do we have any innovation about LiDAR with less volume? I'm not sure I understand the question, but if you mean by like how far can we see with LiDAR, um, I'll try and remember how far I set the um, maximum range of that LiDAR unit. I think it's about 250 meters on the Luminar system but I would need to double check that and I'm not sure we've got time as part of this. Uh, the big I think if we just go for a couple AI more questions, um, David. Right, fine. Let's, pick, let's try and pick out the, the most interesting one. Thing. Yeah, so apologies to people who I'm skipping over. Um, all right, well, this is an interesting one. Can you suggest any softwares which can be learned online which are useful for the future of the automotive industry? Well, from a production standpoint, you are unlikely to see ROS um, in those in a production car, at least not until ROS 2 is finalized, and even then probably not. However, as a free, open source, well-documented, um, well-supported tool for learning about the concepts behind um, self-driving sensors and things like that, I would say that ROS is definitely the way to go. Um, we will be using a combination of, of ROS and WeBots um, on the self-driving 
on collector autonomous vehicle course that we are running because with the existing ROS simulated gazebo is, a, is, is very powerful but a bit difficult to learn. So I would suggest you possibly go to robotbenchmark.net, have a play with the online version of WeBox, and then go from there looking at ROS and WeBox and building up um, would be a way to go. What other questions have we got? Okay, um, so can we be confident that we have allowed our AIs to drive for long enough um, and the simulations cover enough scenarios? Well, that is an unanswered question. Um, I think it's safe to say that while simulations are a fantastic starting point for confirming that our vehicles are driving well, because let's face it, um, they would quickly identify self-driving vehicles which were completely rubbish. Um, you know, if your car immediately just drives into a ditch, the simulation will catch that. But they will need to be validated on the real world and on, in, on the road. What is interesting about self-driving vehicles is that with all the extra data that they collect, they can give far more detailed reports on the accidents that they are involved in. So we've seen this from Tesla and um, the Uber accident. The amount of sensor data which was collected from these vehicles after that crash was much higher than you would get from a, non from a, a less advanced vehicle. So that means that if vehicles do start to have accidents, um, it should be possible to identify what went wrong more easily and to then roll out updates to a vehicle. So although there might be a number of accidents when this technology starts to get rolled out, the technology should quickly improve. Um, again, it depends on what level of automation we're talking about. What's important to remember is that we're not talking about preventing all accidents with self-driving vehicles. Now, that's not realistically going to happen. What we are hopefully discussing is reducing the number of accidents. If we can decrease the number of deaths and the number of injuries that happen on the road, compared to human manual drivers. That would be a good thing, even if the trade-off is still some accidents and injuries. But there is a societal and legislative and uh, um, legal issues to be resolved around that stuff. But from just the point of view of like pure philosophy, you know, ethical goodness, I have to say, I think that self-driving vehicles will be a force for good, just via reducing the number of accidents which happen and reducing the severity of the accidents. So that's that. That's um, a positive note to end on, isn't it, David? Yes. <laughs> uh, just like to uh, thank you very a much. a question there about the follow-up. Um, yes, I think... Uh, um, we answered pretty much we i mean you there's only two slides that you didn't show and you, you flipped through those at the end um and we had an extra question session so we had quite a lot of time we've been over 20 minutes so um yeah. if there are any questions um, you can um email I think you the, possibly say that yeah oh sorry you're doing this yes sorry, I'll, I'll be quiet you can email, so the recording of this will be online with, for the IMA key, and you can email the events inquiries team at the IMA key um, for these slides. And if you've got any questions for David, you can put them there and he'll contact you. Um, thank you, David, very much for dealing with the technical challenges. I'm glad we got it sorted in the end. Um, and I think that just leaves me to say thank you for attending and our closing remarks really are, are clearly security is high on our agenda for AI, AIs and um, thank you for showing us some really interesting demos um, and, and we clearly have some challenges ahead um, and uh, I think we could probably keep on going for an hour on these questions because quite a lot came in but so thank you very much everybody for attending um, and, and we'll leave it there.
Cheers. Thank you, everyone.